Okay, I guess we should start. Um, so, as you can see, Guillaume is still... Can you hear me, Guillaume? Yep. Yep, sorry. It's just that you, you do that uh, gesture for I can't hear you, but okay, fine. Um, so, let's start with the one-minute papers from last time. And uh, so, let's say, okay, I'll do them in the file because uh, that's in, then it's in the right order. Uh, so one comment we had was that it was a bit out of the blue to see a let when we did the, the, the alternative definition of fin. Um, and I think Guillaume just wants me to reassure you that uh, everything you do in a let you can always do at the top level. You never have to use a let. Um, so for example we had here in the previous file, here was the let. So rather than doing this, I introduced the let because I wanted to get access to the two components of the pair. Um, but I could, instead of writing, doing a let and then using k prime here, I could have done a first projection here, right? Or I could have defined it as a separate top-level thing. Um, so it's it's just a convenience. So if you don't like the let, you don't have to use it. Yeah. You could you could use the smart constructor, actually. Isn't that somewhere in this file? Uh, is that worth looking no, at? No, it's in the new one, so... Ah. Yeah, right. So yeah, another way to do it... You could refactor the code, yeah. Yeah, would be to say, okay, so for the normal fin, we had zero and sac constructors, so we could define them for the primed version, which just takes the number zero and sac and package them up with proofs that they are smaller than sac of n, right? So zero prime is zero with tt, because that's the... What it means for zero to be smaller than sac of n. Uh, oh, it's not in scope. So if I say underscore, then Agda will figure it out for me. And the sac prime, if I don't want to use that let, I could pattern match here on the left instead if I introduce it like this. Right. Uh, so you don't have to use a let, you could do it this way. Um, right. Uh, right. And then it's a bit neater how, how this two function goes, right? So in in this file, I wrote it like this. And then after you define the smart constructors, you just send zero to zero prime and suck to suck prime. Right. Uh, yeah. so, so that's a nicer way to do it. It looks a bit cleaner. Yes. So the point of the let, I mean, maybe we should say what let is. Let is a way of getting your hands on the result of an intermediate um, computation. And uh, if it's a record, you can take it apart into its fields, which is what we needed to do to get hold of K and P, K prime and P separately. Yeah, in this recursive call here. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so that's a nicer way to do it. Um, okay, uh, was there anything else? Uh, okay, we tried to make the Agda mode shortcuts clearer when we use them. So thanks for pointing that out. In this room, I think it's slightly, it wouldn't be right. Uh, what we sometimes do near the beginning of 4.10 is we put the keyboard on the document camera and then have one screen showing fingers. Uh, it's not completely ridiculous, but you, you need to kind of grow your cheat sheet of funny keystroke moves. Yeah, so we'll try to say them instead. Uh, okay, and then there was one more comment here was that maybe it would be good to use different constructor names for different data types. Um, and I think we disagree a little bit here. So I, I'm very sympathetic to this. I think it makes things easier. Connor has a philosophical point. That... Yeah. Uh, okay. So to some extent, I can see uh, that in the first instance, uh, it's... Uh, uh, it would make it clearer which thing was which. Um, but ultimately, uh, it leads to a kind of uh, proliferation of, you know, a million million different names for nil and a million different names for cons. Uh, so uh, the, the thing that sorts it out in your head is... Uh, to keep a clearer sense of which type is being pushed inwards. So it's uh, 
really is a situation that the kind of type declaration on the function is telling you something really important about how to read what's in the function. It's not just a comment that that you can ignore. It's vit vital to take the understanding from the type declaration and use that to interpret the symbols you can see. On the other hand, it can be confusing, right? So yeah. I think you have to you have to balance it. Uh, okay, so, so we, we, yeah. we could perhaps say that every data type definition comes with a module definition corresponding to it. So in the two definition here, for instance, we could write fin.0 on the left, right? We could use a fully explicit name to say this is the zero that comes from the fin declaration. Yeah. So if you want to document it in the file just for yourself, then you can use the, the module system to have more, like, uh, to have longer names, to have qualified names. Yeah. So you could if you wanted to, indeed. So this is the fin zero, and this is the natural number suck, and this is the natural number zero. Uh, OK, but let's move on to new things. Uh, so we have one thing left to do from last time. So we did all kinds of logical conjectives. We did and, or, bottom, uh, implication, for all, but we didn't so far do exists. So we'll start by doing exists. Um, so what does it mean to show that there exists some element such that something holds? Right. Well, one way to see it and the way you see it in Agda is that to prove that there exists something is to really give a witness that this thing exists, right? So if I'm claiming that there exists a natural number such that it is odd, then I really have to give you a natural number and a proof that that natural number is odd, right? Otherwise, I haven't really convinced you. Um, so that sounds a lot like, okay, so, so here are the rules saying that if I want to show there exists an n such that p of n, well, if I can show P of M for some specific witness M, uh, then I've done it, right? And how do I eliminate these things? So if Connor tells me that there exists an N such as P of N, uh, but I'm interested in proving C, well, then I can assume that I have an N such that P of N, and if that implies C, then overall I get the C, right? So to introduce it, you have to give a specific M to eliminate it, you have to be able to deal with any n that you're given. You don't know which one it is, right? And yes. it, it's written a bit confusingly here with a for all. Uh, but if you think what it means to give a function of this type, it means that you're given an n and you're given a proof of p of n, right? So this is the classical logic situation where uh, the person who's making use of the existential never gets to find out what the original witness was. So you can see this in the rule. You know, if if I if I know I know that that some property holds for thirty seven, uh, uh, Fred will and I say, okay, this property holds for some number. Fred doesn't get to find out it was thirty seven. Fred has to say, well, I'm not. Yeah, Fred has to be not fussy about which number it was. That's what that for all n is doing. It's saying the person who uses the existential doesn't get to look at the witness. And this is. Uh, Quite unsatisfactory, actually. <laughs> so. Yeah. OK, but if, if we think about this, so what does it mean to have a witness and a proof that it satisfies something? Well, it sounds a lot like the sigma type that we saw last time, right? Saying that I have a first component, and then I have some proof p of x for that specific x. So we can encode exists p as sigma and p, which indeed is a type. So here we said there's a property of natural numbers. So the first component is a natural number such that you have a proof p of x for that particular x. Um, so that's how we encode it. And this is how we use it. So if we have such an exists, so then we have some x, say. Um, Right, okay, and this is our goal, so we can fully normalize this. Then we see that we have a way of dealing with an arbitrary n. Let's call this f. Okay, and now we have to produce a c, but the x is actually a pair 
of an n and a p, so I can pattern match on the x. Okay, it's a first component and a second component, so that's some little n, I guess, some p. Okay, so we see that little n is a natural number, p is a proof that it satisfies the property big P, and now I can feed exactly that to F, right? So F applied to N and P will give me a C. Okay, so I need an N, and I need a P of N. So again, we see that the way to take it apart is to really look at the two components. Um, right, so do you want to do this one, maybe, for okay. change? Let's see if I can cope. So what have we got here? Um, uh, we have a, a counterexample to P. So we, there exists an N that makes P fail. And we are obliged now to show that it's not the case that P is always true. So that um, we're, we're showing, if it's sometimes false, it isn't always true. Is that kind of plausible anyway? You think we might win? <laughs> so let's see. Right, the first component, ooh, uh -huh. I'm already failing to use Fred's computer. First component is some X. Uh, so. That's good. What have we got? And then, uh, then we're supposed to prove not for all p. So that means um, um, that someone is going to give us a proof of all p and ask us to derive a contradiction. Uh, I guess. Um, uh, Guillaume is hoping that I will use the Elim rule for exists. So I've just grabbed my assumptions. Uh, so if I then say um, Elim uh, of X, then uh, Right, so one of the things that actually is hilarious that the tutorial that we just displaced was about natural deduction. When, when you see an elim rule that offers to prove some C that is universally quantified, right, this thing says, I prove C. And you're just, if you're sitting there thinking, what the hell is C? The answer is, it's whatever C would be most convenient to you. Think of it as C for convenient. And, you know, it usually gets instantiated with the goal that's right there in your face. So in this case, that's going to be false. So I'm going to say, I'm going to use elim x question mark, and I'm going to shove it uh, in the hole. And then that will choose, on my behalf, that chooses C is the goal I was trying to prove, which was false, which was the, 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 this thing. Uh, so now I'm obliged to prove that given a number and uh, a, uh, a proof that uh, it's sometimes, that, that, that um, P doesn't hold for that number, I have to extract a contradiction and I do think quite likely to win. Uh, so let's see. Um, I um, uh, So I, I'm going to be given a number, so I'll do that. Oh, can I type a lambda? Uh, I'm going to chicken out. You can hit control backslash when it's your turn. So someone's going to give me a number n and uh, proof that not pn holds and they're gonna i see i'm also writing an old-fashioned ascii arrow uh, uh, and you know could i please prove false so you see what the elim rule 
has done for me is it's got me back to my original goal, but it's now handed me some stuff. It's given me an actual number that P doesn't hold for. OK. So what's my strategy? Well, uh, what if I do control U, control U, control C, control comma, that normalizes all of the information in the info buffer. And you can see not PN is really a give me a proof of PN and I'll give you a proof of false. So this is going to get me to here. All I have to do is prove P of N. But hang on a minute. I know that uh, P holds for all N. That's the assumption I've been given. Again, control U, control U, control C, control comma. So, con so you can think of control U, control U as really. And then control C, control comma is look at what's going on. And so this is really look at what's going on. And I get um, that all P says, well, you give me a number and I'll tell you P of it. And I need P for N. So I'll say all P of N. We're done. Uh, OK. Are we? Uh, do you want to go to Morgan? OK. So. Once upon a time, some idiot told you about De Morgan's laws. Um, uh, and uh, uh, now we're going to see that uh, the truth is a little bit more subtle, or at least in some interpretations of logic where not everything is testable, and we're not just trying to check whether a uh, wire is at zero volts or five volts, that. Uh, uh, that the things which work for kind of Boolean signals are not always completely transportable to logic more generally. Uh, so uh, uh, what we're going to do is split De Morgan's laws into uh, each of them into two implications. So instead of saying these are the same, we say left hand side implies right hand side, right hand side implies left hand side. OK, so not or forwards is saying if neither, so if, if A or B is false, so that's to say uh, neither A nor B, uh, um, so um, if we know neither A nor B, uh, then we know not A and not B. Does this seem believable? Uh, you, you can you can't, eat the, the, you can't eat prove either of them, so they're both wrong. You know. OK, let's give ourselves a go. So someone's going to give us. Um, uh, yeah, it's hard to describe this type in English, right? Because the Morgan's laws are almost built into the language. Already. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm just going to call that assumption N. Um, and I keep doing bad things with Fred's trackpad. OK, so now I'm asked to prove. So I've got an assumption, and now I'm asked to prove um, uh, the, uh, you know, a, a pair of things. OK, so I should be able to prove them one at a time. I have to prove not A. And what that means is that someone is going to hand me an A, and I'm going to shove them into a puddle. So somebody hands me an A. OK. How am I going to shove them into a puddle? Really look at what's going on. I've got one strategy available to me for proving false. It's using N. Okay, so N says, well, okay, fine, now I'll prove A or B, I don't really care which. Which are we going to pick? I mean, someone's handed us an A, so let's do it. In fact, uh, I, Agda will do it for me and I won't have to type Unicode. Um, then uh, uh, in the other side, Lambda B, 
arrow question mark. Uh, look at what's going on. Same deal. I'm going to use N again. This time it says, um, uh, give us an A or a B. I don't care. Well, this time I've been handed a B. So fine. Cool. Uh, uh, right. Uh, shall I do the three boring ones and you can have the fun one? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that was okay. Always reload. Right. Uh, if you can't, if you can't see your completed proof in color with no funny colored background, you can't really believe it. So always be reloading is the message. Okay, so can I? I see what it is. It is it? No, I'm completely failing to operate your computer, Brad. Well, that was lucky. Okay, so now this time I'm going to get. Um, I know that not A and I know not B, and I have to show that uh, anyone who thinks A or B is true is 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 not helping. Okay, so what happens? Okay, my first input is a pair of proofs of not A and not B. And then what's my goal now? Well, if I really look at it, you can see I've got a proof that A is false, and I've got a proof that B is false, and I need a proof that A or B is false. So that's fine. Someone's claiming A or B, I will say, thank you very much. I will, I guess, am I supposed to be using Aurelim? I just want to do it by pattern matching. Um, all right, so somebody has a proof of A or B. I am entitled to ask which. Um, so, um, uh, you know, when I was a kid, um, uh, I would ask my father, you know, which would go better, uh, brown sauce or ketchup? Or it's like, <laughs> would, uh, you know, sh should I use brown sauce or ketchup? He would say yes. <laughs> so, uh, because he was trying to get me to grow up to be a logician. And uh, 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 yeah, so, uh, so the point was that, uh, that it's not the same thing as asking which. Well, in this sort of logic, it is the same thing as at least allowing yourself to be asked which. You know, if someone says A or B, if someone claims A or B is true, you are allowed to ask, well, which is it? You know, that's quite a strong power to have over them. So I'm going to say, well, which is it? And then I'm going to rename the variables so that they're sensibly named. So here, um, uh, whoever it was that was claiming A or B has said, well, actually, it's A. So how are we going to win? <laughs> yeah, we happen to know. I mean, we, we hold all the cards, right? We know not A. So that can go away. Um, oh, this keeps happening. And then in this case, instead they chose B, but we're also ready for them on that score. So MB of B. Okay. Right. Um, uh, so... Uh, that was us asking, uh, which is it? Next, we get to ask, which isn't it? So this is uh, uh, dealing with not and, and we're saying, well, when we know uh, that either A is false or B is false, then we know they're not both true. So if... Uh, if one of them's false, they're not both true. Plausible? Right. And once again, someone is going to give us um, uh, 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 the, the proof that um, one of these two is false. And they're going to give us a proof that they're both true. And we're going to have to derive a contradiction. So let's see. Load up, look at what's happening. You can see we 
we know that one of them's false. We know they're both true. We've got to shove that in a puddle. Um, OK, so step one, take this pair apart, which I did by hand, so I didn't have to rename things. Uh, OK, look again. We also can make whoever's putting us in this situation tell us which of the two things isn't true. We've got a proof of an or in the we've got a proof of or in the context so we can ask which. OK. Oop, fingers. So we've got two cases, quite similar, and you can see it's uh, it's the same same sort of story. They they tell us that it's a that's not true, and we're ready. Oh great! <laughs> I've actually got a proof of a. <laughs> Likewise, in this case, they did okay. Now maybe it was B that wasn't true. Still got you covered, mate. Right. Okay. So you notice here that they were forced to give us an actual bit. They were forced to tell us which of the two was false. And either way, we were able to get them in trouble. But there you go. This says a bit comes in. And we were able to deliver a contradiction. But now Fred's task is to do that the other way around. Yeah. So to, to stress that point again, these are the same thing but in different directions, right? It's saying if this is not true, then, then I know this. And this says if I know this, then I get back again. So you could try to do the same thing here, saying, OK, we could go this way. And we remember from 106 that, that this, the Morgan's Laws says that you can go both ways. So can we go this way? Um, but if we look at this type, then it looks a bit suspicious because on this side, we really have some information, right? Did we go left or did we go right? That's why we could pattern match on it here. Whereas on this side, we don't have any information. We just have that something is impossible. Right? Something implies bottom. Uh, so to go this way would be to go from no information to one bit of information, right? which seems quite suspicious. So I'm not sure what Guillaume has put in the file here. Uh, right. So it's just lined it up, saying, OK, to go this way, we need to implement this. Right. Um, OK, so what can I do in this situation? Well, I have this. I can ask what's really going on. Control U, control U. Uh, so we see that I know that something implies bottom, and this is my goal. But I don't have a proof of A, and I don't have a proof of B, so I can't really use this assumption for anything, right? I can only do that if I had know that A and B is true. Uh, and I am asked up front to prove this disjunction, and I can say, OK, I can refine this, Control c Control r And then Agda will tell me that I don't know which constructor you want. Do you want the left injection or the right injection? Right. These are the only ways I can introduce something of this type uh, up here. Uh, and I don't know which one to choose. I mean, I can choose one of them, inch one. Uh, I'm not sure what you go you... back to yeah, I switched off Unicode. Uh -huh. Control backslash. Yeah. Right. So I can say, OK, I want the second injection. That's fine. But then here, I have to show not B, right? OK, that's also kind of fine, because that means I get given B, and I have to produce bottom. So it looks like I'm making progress. But now I've run out of road, right? I have to produce a proof of false. And I have a proof of B, but to use my assumption, I would also need a proof of A, and I just don't have the A, right? So I could say, okay, maybe I choose the wrong thing. This should have been the first injection, in which case I get given a proof of A instead. Um, 
so now I don't have the B to, to continue. So I just can't actually use the information I have to produce this. And, and the basic problem is that there is no information here, but there is a little bit of information here, right? Because I know if I went left or right. Um, so this is just not provable uh, in Agda. I'm just going to comment that out. Uh, however, if we know that things are decidable, then we can sometimes recover things, right? So remember that being decidable meant that we know that A or not A is true. Uh, so if we know that A is decidable or B is decidable, then we can actually recover this because there are some bits hidden inside here, right? Let's see if we can prove this. So we have decidable AB. And we have some P, say. Let's see what we have. Uh, so I have this proof that A or B are decidable, and I have P which says not A, B, really. We name it like that. Okay. Um, and now, again, I'm asked to commit. Should I go left? Should I go right? But before I commit, I can look at this proof that A or B are decidable, right? So I can pattern match on that. B and D, B. So this one says decidable A, this one says decidable B. Okay, so again I must commit, but before I do that I can say, okay, is it the case that A is true or that not A is true? So I can pattern match on that. This one says A is true, this one says not A. Okay, so in this case, I know that A is true, um, and I have to decide, should I prove not A or should I prove not B? Well, I would be stupid to prove not A if I know that A is true, right? So I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to go right. Okay, so now I have to prove not B, which means I'm given a B, uh, and then I have to prove false. But now I'm actually in a good situation, right? Because I know that if I can produce A and B, then I get false. And now I have both an A and a B. So we're in business. Okay, A or B, well, that's A and a B. Right. Okay, what about this case? Uh, so here, I know not A, and I'm asked to prove not A or not B. Well, I think I'm going to prove not A. Because that's exactly what I have. Right. Okay, and here everything is now completely symmetrical, right? So we can do the same thing. We can look at is B or not B true? Right, if B is true, then I'm going to go right. I'm going to be given a B. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm going to go left. I'm given an A. Uh, because now I have both an A and a B, so I can say that. Here I'm going to go right. So if we have a little bit more information coming in, then we can actually prove this. But it's not the case that we necessarily know if A or B are decidable, right? Um, okay, and then there's a comment here saying that there's a lot of symmetry, which I already thought of and when we did it, right? You could do the last two cases much quicker because they were just the same as the first cases, but swapped. Uh, so the challenge is to find a way to factor them out. Um, right. Um, so why don't you prove this law then? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good reason why not. Um, so this is an interesting, uh, uh, interesting puzzle. Um, it's um, uh, it's more or less called um, Markov's principle. Um, okay. So. 
Um, we get told uh, that it is not the case that P is always true for all the natural numbers. P is some property about natural numbers. And, uh, uh, and we know it isn't true for all of the natural numbers. Uh, but does that mean we know the number for which it's false? Um, so again, we saw the other direction before, right? Where we went from this not here and to not wrong P. Oh. Again, we are trying to turn this round and, and go from yeah. no information to some information. Yeah. So just as a moment ago, yeah, when we were asked for an actual bit and we just had a load of negative information, sorry, up here, we were asked for an actual bit and we had a load of negative stuff. Here, we're being asked for quite a lot of bits. I mean, <laughs> we're being asked to give an actual number and all we've got is a load of negative information. It's, um, uh, it, it ain't gonna happen. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, if you think about it this way, we're, we're also, um, um, uh, we're also abstract with respect to P. I mean, it's one of the other kind of handles on these problems is that we don't get to look at what A says or what B says in order to think about any of these things. Uh, we, can't, um, we can't look at what, um, what this big P is. So we're potentially in trouble. Uh, I mean, so some philosophers would argue that, uh, that there is uh, a method I could use to find this witness. Um, if uh, this is what's uh, what's coming is, is really this thing. Yeah, that's the other thing. We don't even know whether we can decide P. So uh, even kind of just like starting at zero and seeing what what happens. <laughs> you know, yeah, test zero, test one, test two. I mean, we don't know. We don't know how to test P. We're just promised that it's never true. Uh, so that it's not that it's uh, not that it's never true. We're um, promised exactly that it's uh, it's not the case that it's always uh, that it's always true. So we we got no handle on how to to find the place where p is false. I mean, we can't even test p. Uh, so this this. This magic number is not concealed in this information. This just tells us how to falsify stuff. It doesn't tell us, you know, the concrete fact that, you know, look at 37 and you will know. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, Guillaume is suggesting that we consider this uh, possibility. Um, and uh, yes, so we're saying um, that if we know that we can test P for all the numbers and we know that it's P is, uh, that it, it's not true everywhere, then we do have a strategy that we could use uh, to search for a number that uh, uh, for which P is false. And that is exactly the strategy uh, I suggested. So maybe I can do an example of a thing. Um, uh, I want to write a function that basically tries starting from zero, testing all the things. Um, so, um, so let's see. Uh, uh, 
so I basically, I wish there was a function called try em all that solved my problem, that took as its argument the next number to try. And I'm going to kick it off at zero. Okay. Of course, I haven't written try em all yet. I'm about to. But I'm imagining I've written it and saying, well, I wish that was the answer to my problem. And now I do a keystroke, control C, control itch. And that's saying, dear Agda, please cook up the type that try em all would have to have for this to work. So that's control C, control H. H for helper. So here we yeah. see that it's actually a good idea to, to be explicit about which zero you want. Uh huh, because it doesn't because know. It doesn't know which zero you want, so it's just inserted a question mark for that argument. Okay. So let me uh, type it for you. I'm going to type that zero. <laughs> and that will sort me out. Right, so now it's figured out. Uh, that uh, that's the type try em all should have. So can I use your keyboard? Uh, what's copy? Um, uh, oop, and then it pastes slightly before I was ready for that. Right. Right, and I, it's complaining that I haven't written try em all yet, but I'm going to make sure that it solves the problem. Okay, try em all n. Am I going to get away with this? Okay, so what do we do? Um, uh, our first step is uh, going to be, because somebody has told us we can do deck. We can decide if I, what's, let's just look at what we've got here. You've got this thing which says for any uh, natural number, we can get a decision on P for that number. So if I say deck N, um, that gives me a decision on P of N. If I can, so that was control C, control dot. It's a bit like control C, control comma. So that's, control C, control comma is, look at the problem. But then if you type something in this brace, and then you do control C, control dot, it looks at the problem, but it also looks at the thing we've typed and says, okay, you've just cooked up one of these things. Okay, so if I stick control U, control U on the front of that, it will normalize stuff and it will tell me that it's giving me this disjunction. Either P of N is true or P of N is false. Okay. Now, I would like this to be in a place where I can pattern match on it. So unless I am <laughs> removed from the stage <laughs> rapidly, I'm going to illustrate another feature of Agda. Um, so, uh, yeah. So what we're saying is we've got this, we know how to compute this value. It's got this OR type. We'd like to pattern match it, but annoyingly, it's on the right-hand side of our program. If we, if we could somehow pull it to the left-hand side of our program, where we could get a good look at it, then we could figure out what to do. So there's a feature of Agda whose job is to add an extra column of stuff to the things we are allowed to look at on the left-hand side of the program. And that thing is called with. I say with deck n, and then I write a new line, and I copy manually because I can't use this keyboard very well. Uh, try them all n, I add a vertical bar, and then I write a name for uh, the I'm adding an extra column corresponding to the value of deck n. So I reload that. I'll just delete that. Look at what I've got. And now, what do you know? I've got my all the things I had before, but I've got this extra x that's the output of this computation. And now, and I've got it on the left-hand side. I'm allowed to pattern match on it. 
Um, so uh, let's see, what have we here? This is, uh, here, let's just give these things sensible names. And we'll actually do the second one first. Okay, so here, in the, in the no case, we actually got handed a proof that P of N is false, which is great news. <laughs> we found the wrong end. <laughs> right, uh, so we can say, okay, I'm ready to go. I'm going to give back a pair of things. N is my concrete witness. I found it. And here is your proof of P of N is false. So now we have to decide, well, what do we do when it turns out that P of N was true? Um, right, yeah. <laughs> Try them all. Suck on. And um, so Agda, if I remove this, if I degenerate this pragma to a comment, Agda really doesn't believe that this program, that this strategy of just keep on going till you find it will actually work. It's got it. There's certainly nothing that we've done explains uh, why uh, this thing, this input, the proof that it's, it's not the case that P is always true. We haven't found any way to turn this into an explanation of why just blundering through all the numbers is going to succeed in the end. But certainly no, we haven't used this fact at all. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Agda doesn't support a way to, to turn this thing into something that justifies why this kind of completely unbounded search is okay, uh, which is why uh, uh, in order to make the termination checker just shut up and let us get on with it, we labeled this non-terminating. But this is, this is only for sport stuff, right? You're not allowed it. And uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, so Agda likes to be convinced that, that things are going to stop. And there's nothing here to convince Agda that this unbounded search is, is going to work. Um, you know, we could, <laughs> you, you could do try them all for a P that always, that was always true, and then it really wouldn't, it would get stuck in a loop. So somehow, if this was going to work, you would expect to need to use this piece of information somewhere in the explanation, and we just haven't. Uh, so that was uh, a bit of uh, Markov exploration, and it looks like it's, and we stopped. Uh, yes, uh, uh, there is a sort of explanation of why a lecture like this is going to come to an end. It's not unbounded, um, unlike that search procedure. Good.